This is what you've got in me. First three chapters. Now go to work, church. Shine your light, church. Make a difference, church. Run to me, church. Do all your ministry out of my presence. All of your ministry out of my presence. He's going to say in chapter 4, gather together, church, and you are the horsepower of all that's being done. The horsepower is not in the pulpit. The horsepower is in the pew. Ephesians chapter 4. It says, corporately, come to me, corporately. Unite the whole body in my presence and flow ministry out of my presence. Chapter 5, individually. We gather together uh, committed. Are we doing that separately during the week? Ephesians 5 says that every individual must come to me and spend time with me. Walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. Chapter 5, 1 through 15. And then he says, walk in the Spirit. Speaking to the individual in chapter 5. And then he talks about marriage, doesn't he, at the end of chapter 5. And he ends this very difficult, very difficult, uh, with a difficult situation about spiritual warfare. He talks about parenting, he talks about work, and then he gets into spiritual warfare. The battle is real, folks. And listen to how he concludes his great epistle to the Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That is in the passive tense. It means you cannot muster up the strength. You cannot muster it up. Find your strength in the Lord. Go to Him for your strength. And put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. That is the command. That is not the advice of a general. That is the command of a general. Put on the armor. People ask me all the time, even people that have been in church a long time, do you believe in the devil? And I try to just keep my face from contorting. I certainly do. And he is active. And he doesn't take the day off. And he is evil. And he is clever. And he is a deceiver. And he, and he is faithful to his task. He's counterfeit. And the Bible has given us his strategy. We know we can win this war. The gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus said that in Matthew 16 before He even set the church free. In the book of Acts, set them loose. We need the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He's not saying able to make progress. There's time in the Christian life. You just need to hold your ground. The Christian life is not like football where you don't make any ground on first down, so you get second down. First and ten, second and ten, no ground, third and ten, and punt. We lost the ball. It's not how Christian life is. And you know what? The harder the battle, the more bullets that are flying, the more you've got to lay low and stand still and don't move. Sometimes that's what we do in a war, folks. That you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Folks, do you read that and you, you say you believe that? How can you not pray for God's wisdom and God's protection? We remember 1 John 4, 4, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We, we are not greater than the enemy, but he who is in us is greater. And if you want to fight the devil without the Lord, you will lose every time. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. With truth. Truth holds things together. Truth holds things up. Without truth, you can't put anything else on. It's got to be there first. Everything goes on top of that. We live in a world that says, what is truth? Josh McDowell, how many of you know that name? Josh McDowell, more than a carpenter. He was sort of the guy going on the campuses years ago. He said the biggest problem 20 years ago on the college campus was, the students were saying, there's no such thing as truth 20 years ago. Now they're saying, you have no right to believe in absolute truth. They're not saying they don't have, we don't have a right to believe in that. This is the world we're living in. 
How dangerous it is. Evil day. I think a lot of times, you know, Satan, God will protect us, but you know what? If you're serving the Lord, you, you're going to understand this battle. And if you're not in the battle, then you might not understand it. But Christianity is like a, Christianity is like a, like a football game, if I could say that. Like Neyland Stadium. Could I say that, Bill, and get away with that today? How many, how many people in that stadium? 108. Christianity is a lot like a football game at Neyland Stadium. 108,000 people desperately needing exercise. 22 people desperately needing rest. We're laughing, but that's how the church is. We've got too few people doing too much. Gobs of people need to get... Christianity is not a football game. And you know what? Some, you get wounded, we've got to patch you up. We've got to mend you up. You, if you're wounded, we've got to set you out until you get rested, come around you and, and help you get back in the game, back on the field. That's what it's going to take. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. God, you know, there's a lot of transactions that take place when you become a Christian. The one we rejoice in is that sin is taken out and Holy Spirit's put in. Sin's out, we're forgiven, Holy Spirit's in for the power, but we're also told that the righteousness of Christ is put in. His righteousness is in us, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I mean, it's there, folks, for us. We have that. Let's walk in that. And I think when we live unrighteously, we let breastplate gets lowered and we become more vulnerable when we live righteously and keep clean accounts with god and with people that breastplate stays in place shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace your feet to go to go to go to the people to go to the world to go to the neighborhood get your feet moving with the gospel of peace we are a peculiar army we don't want to kill anybody we're recruiting the enemy to join our team we don't strap bombs around ourselves. We just strap our shoes so we can go and tell the enemy, God wants you on his team. God wants you in his army. Nobody's more proof of that than the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He was a general in the devil's army when God found him, arrested him, and converted him. And God recruited him and changed his loyalties. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer. Here it is, folks. The armor of God does not stop in verse 17. You cannot conclude with armor. It concludes with prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, not in the flesh being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. One of the things we're not doing is praying enough about our own life, our own need, our own lack of wisdom, our own lack of boldness. We're not doing enough prayer for ourselves. But there's another set of prayer that we've got to do once we do that. And that's praying for others. Praying for others. We start praying for each other in this church. They'll never, nothing can shake us. The world, if the world comes against us, we'll, ra we'll rally. If the devil comes against us, we'll rally. But if we can't, if we can't, from inside, if we can't stay together, we'll fall apart. It's from the inside out. We have to pray. We have to pray biblically. We have to pray for ourselves. We have to pray for others. We get to do this. What a privilege it is. Paul's sentence is not complete. In verse 18, your Bible, it should not be a period there. He's, he's continuing a thought that's picked up in verse 19. And pray for me. Now listen carefully. The great Apostle Paul is asking for prayer. That utterance may be given to me, that I might open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in change, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
God, give me a Holy Spirit-produced confidence in You that people see when I speak. He really believes it. That his, that's his sermon. Where's Barbara Easterly? She's up here somewhere. she up here? Where's she, Barbara? Is she, she here this service? Next service. She said to me, she grabbed me a couple Sundays ago, and I don't know why she said this, but I loved it. She said, Pastor John, thank you for preaching your own sermons. So thank you for believing they're my own. 